much, Tom. And thank you to UMass Boston for inviting me here to be here. It's nice to be out of my binder and on a stage sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> we actually do have binders full of women in our office. I should have brought them. There are hundreds of women we've trained, so that's been very exciting. So we hear a lot about women in politics. Uh, we hear about whether or not 2012 is the next year of the woman, how to court women's vote, whether or not there is a war on women. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about what is the gender disparity of women in politics, what can we do about it together, and what are some of the barriers to women running. So what's the big idea? What's the big picture here? I'm going to throw out some shocking statistics. Some of you may know these, some of you may not. Um, but I want you to follow along, tweet along. Um, and I did actually put up our, both my personal Twitter handle and our Emerge Massachusetts Twitter handle to follow on the conversation. So the United States ranks 90th in the world for women in elected office. So you can see from this chart here, we're behind countries like Rwanda, Mexico, China, Pakistan, and we're only four slots up from Libya. Wow, we say. Across the country, only six states have a female governor. Six of 50. At the end of 2012, unless we elect the Democratic woman running in New Hampshire for governor, we may have zero women, Democratic women governors in the United States. It's been 50 years since, we've had a, we, since we haven't had a woman governor supporting women's right to choose in the United States. You may have heard this. The US uh, women just make up 17% of the US Congress. The good news is women are actually running in higher numbers this year than ever before. Uh, that's really a result of a few things. I think the war on women has uh, actually motivated folks to step up and run for office, and redistricting has created more opportunities across the country for women to run. Right here at home, Massachusetts has elected only four women to the U.S. House, four, that's right, ever. Never elected a woman to the U.S. Senate, yet, am I allowed to say that? <laughs> Uh, and the 07 election of Congresswoman Saugus added a 25-year period in Massachusetts that we had no women representing us. Often people say to me, well, why are you doing this work in Massachusetts? Aren't you doing okay? You're pretty solidly blue. You must have lots of women running. And in fact, the statistics to show that we have a lot of room to grow. In terms of our state house and state legislature, we're right around 24%. Um, and we rank about smack dab in the middle um, of all the states in the, in the United States in terms of the numbers of women in our state houses. In fact, 2010 was the first year, both in Congress and in our state house, the number of women actually declined in decades. On the municipal level, which I, I love talking about local politics, because I think that's where some of the action is, women make up only 19% of municipal um, elected officials. And this is actually the statistic I find most astounding and what wakes me up in the morning is that 36% of our 351 cities and towns have zero women on our governing local bodies and councils. So that's our city councils, our boards of selectmen, our boards of aldermen, zero women representing us in, th in over a third of our cities and towns in Massachusetts. So one thing you can do today is to go home and check out that list. Look at who's on your city council, where you live, and figure out how many women are on there. So why do we need more women in politics? I like putting up that now infamous photo of the birth control panel to remind us why we need more women. One of the reasons, and this often is what I cite as the, as the most compelling reason, is that women are actually more effective lawmakers. So what does that mean? It means that women actually introduce more bills to Congress. They get more co-sponsors for those bills that they do introduce. And they bring home more money to their districts than their male counterparts do. What does that equal out to? It's about 9% more money than their male counterparts, about $49 million. And this is a pretty recent study. This actually is a picture of the, anyone know? First woman who represented us in Congress in 1917 before a woman got the right to vote. So want some more compelling reasons? Um, unlike their male counterparts, women often run for office for a policy issue. I hear women every day say to me, you know, there was an issue at my child's school, which is why I decided to run for office, or there was an issue in my town that got me really motivated to run. And we see that women often run for office to do something, and men typically to be somebody or for the power that comes with that position. We also know that women have voted consistently in favor of better environmental policies, true also for policies affecting children, families, and women. 
So we know they have an impact there. I believe, I disappeared there for a second, that a critical mass of women will make a real difference. What does critical mass mean? Research shows that when you get a group of people, whether that's an elected body or a corporate board, and 30% of that group is made up of women, the discourse changes, the values change, the conversation changes. And that's true of Congress, it would be true in our state houses, if we got to that critical mass, which is 30%. We also know that women tend to be more inclusive. They reach a lot across party lines. Uh, they more easily build bridges with each other. For those who don't know, uh, the senior women member of the Senate, Barbara Mikulski, hosts these monthly dinners um, in Congress. And she brings all the women senators together across the board, um, across parties, and they just let their hair down. They talk families, they talk challenges, uh, you know, sometimes they talk shop, but it's a way for them to build that, to, to build that bridge, to build relationships with each other, and to support each other in the Senate, and that goes a long way. There was actually, as I was saying, you can't wake up in the morning anymore and, and not read about women in politics. Just two days ago, um, Senator Gillibrand was talking about why she, she was being interviewed, about, about why she's helping to elect so many female candidates this cycle. She's raising millions and millions of dollars, and people are wondering why. Is she gonna run for president, or what is her ulterior motive? And she said, very frankly, that she remembered what the impact was when Nancy Pelosi appointed five women to the Armed Services Committee. And here's what Gillibrand said. That changed the nature of the debate on the committee. Gabby Giffords was the first person who said, 70% of these men and women are coming home with post-traumatic stress disorder. She turned the focus towards the men and women fighting in these wars. It just creates a better outcome when women are at the table. And this was an article that was just yesterday, so certainly a timely topic. Uh, and men just say the darndest things, don't they? <laughs> uh, these are three quotes, some of my favorites, um, of, of things that male politicians have said in 2012. Of course, we can't forget Todd Aiken's comment about uh, legitimate rape and female bodies having a way to shut that whole thing down. That was news to me in my magical uterus. Um, Pennsylvania Governor Tom Corbett when asked about whether or not he was gonna consider a forced ultrasound law and what that would feel like for women in his state, he said, I'm not making anybody watch, okay? Because you just gotta close your eyes. And then Wisconsin State Senator, he uh, voted to repeal the Equal Pay Act in, in Wisconsin this year, in April. And he said, you can argue that many is more important for men. I think a guy in their first job, maybe because they expect to be a breadwinner, someday, may be a little more money conscious. To attribute everything to a so-called bias in the workplace is just not true. Fun fact, folks, 53% of women are now primary breadwinners. <laughs> oh yeah, it actually goes on and on. I, um, my fun fact is I was looking for quotes to include in this presentation uh, a couple weeks ago, and I was looking for this one particular quote about a, that a congressman made in the early 2000s about mammograms. There was a congressional hearing on mammograms, and he said, this topic doesn't affect me. And a, a congresswoman turned to him and said, do you not have a mother, a wife, a daughter? Um, and it was, it was such a point and example of why we need more women in politics, but I couldn't find the name because there were so many other crazy things that have been said this year uh, that I included these. There was another one that I, it was too hard to stomach um, where a congressman on August 1st uh, compared the day that birth control got covered under the Affordable Care Act to Pearl Harbor on September 11th. True story. <laughs> so what's the big problem besides crazy things that men say sometimes? We know, we, we know the startling statistics. We know why we need more women in politics. So why, wh what's going on? Why aren't they out there? The truth is that women actually win elections at the same rates as men do. This is the only thing you remember today. It's that women win elections at the same rate as men do. They just aren't running at the same rates as men are. So why is that? Why are they not running at the same rates? Jennifer Lawless and Richard Fox did a survey in 2011, and this was published in, in January of 2012, of 4,000 male and female candidates, and asked them a lot of different questions about the gender gap in politics. 
they compared these surveys to surveys done in 2001 and found that seven factors contributed to these gender gaps. So I'm going to go over those really quickly. The first, women view the electoral environment as more highly competitive and biased against female candidates. So they believe actually seven of 10 women doubt that they raise enough, as much money as men do. And the fact is that no differences actually emerge for women's vote totals, their fundraising numbers, or electoral success. So here, it's really important to remember that perception is reality when it comes to political ambition. The second, and one I'm going to spend a little bit of time on, is that in 2008, Hillary Clinton's and Sarah Palin's candidacies really aggravated what we saw in terms of sexism in the media and the gender bias in, in, in politics. I don't know if you remember from four years ago, but I couldn't wake up any day without hearing about Hillary Clinton's teary moment, Sarah Palin's choice of wardrobe or shoes, <clears throat> and I was not waking up <clears throat> when John Boehner became speaker to talk about his teary moment. Right? In fact, last week, actually, a week ago today on the 17th, there was a debate between Senator Gillibrand and her Republican female opponent, and the moderator asked during a lightning round if they had read Fifty Shades of Grey. I just don't see debates between two men where the moderator asks if they subscribe to Playboy. I just don't. So we see that this sexism really makes an impact on women. And these are four pictures that show this very poignantly. So this uh, top left photo of Sarah Palin is actually a blow-up doll. And the instructions, I want to read this out loud, includes instructions to blow her up, show her how you're going to vote, let her pound your gavel over and over. This blow-up doll could really satisfy all those swing voters. Lovely. The picture next to that is a picture taken, the Reuters image actually, taken between her legs at a campaign rally. The far left bottom corner is uh, the Hillary Clinton nutcracker toy. And the far right is the uh, iron my shirt man who came to a campaign rally. Chris Matthews said that the reason Hillary Clinton is a senator and the reason she's a candidate for president is because her husband messed around. Tucker Carlson said about Hillary Clinton that when she comes on television, I involuntarily cross my legs. So I can't blame women for not wanting to run for office after experiencing these kinds of comments and complete bias in 2008. The third reason, and I see this every single day in my work, women are much less likely than men to think they are qualified to run for office. So if you see from this chart here, women are actually twice as likely than men more than twice as likely to rate themselves as not at all qualified to run. I hear women all the time come into the Emerge program and say, you know, I'm taking this program because I know I've, I've, you know, I've run neighborhood organizations, I've campaigned for other candidates, but I just don't feel qualified enough to run. I don't yet have a PhD in political science. Um, I don't, you know, I'm not a published author. And we see men wake up, you know, wake up one morning, uh, get dressed and say, I'm going to run for Senate. The fourth reason, ah, oh, this is one of my favorite quotes. Um, so Rep. Loretta Sanchez is a, is a Democrat out of California. She said, when you ask a man to run, he says, OK, but the party's going to have to do this for me, and the party's going to have to do that for me, and you're going to have to throw a fundraiser. When you ask a woman to run, she says, do you think I'm qualified? The fourth reason that women don't run. Female potential candidates are less competitive, less confident, and more risk averse. I actually, uh, we hosted a, a panel on, on Sunday with Shannon O'Brien recently, who was the former treasurer and ran against Mitt Romney in, in 2002. And she talked about her experience um, in sports as a reason that she felt prepared to run for office. Um, and she said this great quote that I want to share with you. She said, the, the hardest contact sport besides rugby out there is running for office. The fifth reason is women just respond more negatively to things like fundraising, talking to the press, going negative on a campaign. They're not interested in those tactics which are essential often for running an effective campaign. We actually, we teach uh, all of these skills in our Emerge program. 
Um, and a few years ago, we had a woman in the program who went through, we do it, we actually do a door-to-door -door simulation. So we can teach women what it's like to go door-to-door, -door, knock on someone's door, and ask for their vote. After the two-hour simulation, she turns to me and she says, this is why I'm not running for office. The entire experience turned her off so much uh, that she had decided then and there that this wasn't for her. So this reason, number six, is a lot of why Emerge was created. It's, I think, key to changing the, the discourse and the conversation about women in politics. It's that women are less likely than men to receive the suggestion to run. They are not, just not recruited to run for office. You often hear in this line of work that women have to be asked between five and seven times to run. Men require zero asks. Um, and, the, and the type of recruitment matters as well. <clears throat> women have to be asked by trusted leaders, often party leaders, um, people that they feel like they have a relationship with. Uh, there was a, a true story, part of this research showed that there was a man who was sitting at a bar don't all good jokes start that way? And uh, he was watching CNN on the screen. It was a quiet bar. And the, bartender, and, the, and the man at the bar was engaging the bartender in conversation about what was on the screen. And the bartender said, wow, you know a lot about politics. You should run for office. And the man felt that he was recruited to run. Women say, I, you know, the party leader doesn't know who I am. Or my, my local town committee member doesn't know who I am and hasn't recruited me, so I don't feel recruited, when every one of her friends and family have told her to run for office. So the type of recruitment really matters for women. The seventh reason is that women are still responsible for many of the childcare and household tasks. This is a great quote here, I'll just paraphrase. Uh, Rep Representative Lynn Martin in the 80s uh, had called her daughter and said, I was just in the president's office, and her daughter then turned turned her on the phone and said, great, are you going to be here for carpool? So we know that there tends still to be that gender division of labor at home as well. Have I depressed you yet? <laughs> all right, so what now? What, what can we all do about this really important issue? One, and this is incredibly important, and what you can, what you can all do and take from this speech today, recruit women you know to run for office. I can guarantee you all know at least someone in your community, in your town, in your workplace, at your doctor's office, someone you know who's passionate about an issue, who would be an incredible legislator, city councilor, school committee member, but hasn't thought about running herself. You should ask her to run, get three people you know to ask her to run, and in two years, ask her to run again. That will make a big impact. Two, help us spread the word about women's electoral success. We see that perception is, is truly reality, and women are, aren't believing that, that other women are running and winning. So help us spread the word when women do run and win. Work on eliminating the gender division of labor. Refer a woman to a political training program, and I'll give you some resources to do that today. And help us call out sexism in the media. There's a great project called Name It, Change It, where you can send them uh, examples of these kinds of issues that come up, and they will spread the word. And don't forget to vote on November 6th. It makes you feel big and strong. I know those people who laughed saw the debate. The others, you should watch it. <laughs> so what does Emerge do? We do a lot of the things that were talked about in terms of barriers. We recruit women to run for office. I go statewide and talk to groups of women in book clubs and bars um, and big rooms and small about the importance of running for office, why they are qualified to run, and I ask them over and over. And then we get them in the training program and we ask them again over and over, and then I have board members call and ask them to run for office, and this is a really key part of what we do. We do this incredible comprehensive six-month training program that runs from January through June that teaches women the skills they need to run for office, things like fundraising, public speaking, media relations, and messaging, and we help build women's confidence so they believe that they are, in fact, qualified to run. We are part of a national network, so Emerge is in 10 states, moving into two more by the end of the year, and uh, as you probably saw from my bio, I'll be moving on to work for our larger Emerge America organization in January to help build new states. So hope to be growing pretty soon, pretty fast. Here are some other training programs for both men and women that you can refer folks to um, here in Massachusetts and across the country. 
And if you're interested in learning more, please feel free to get in touch, refer women to our program, ask them to run, and I thank you so much for letting me be here today. Thank you. Sit with you for a second. Sure. Great. Judy Newfeld, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, yes, you remind us of funny situations, the all-male birth <laughs> control panel. What's the problem, Judy? What is the problem with that? Um, and binders full of women, you have them too. We do. So what's the big deal? Mitz just got some binders full of women. <laughs> um, questions, why don't you train Republican women? Sure. Um, because we can choose not to, <laughs> to be frank. Same question. You know, our, uh, our, it's, a, it's an excellent question. Um, as an organization, when we started 10 years ago, uh, we found that Democratic women just tend to vote on issues that the founders cared about more, you know, environment, um, women and children's issues, public safety, et cetera. Um, and so when they formed it, when we formed Emerge, um, we realized that there were very few partisan organizations out there doing recruitment and training, and we felt like that gave us a competitive edge. A competitive edge to get more, so your first priority is Democrats in office or women in office? That's an excellent question. It's <laughs> um, it is something we debate ourselves as an organization. It's 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 both. It's Democratic women. We believe that they tend to vote more um, on the issues that we care about as an organization. Um, and certainly, we wouldn't run a Democratic woman against another Democrat or train her if she was in the same district as a Democrat. Um, we believe that that. You know, it, having Democratic women is really key to changing the conversation. If, if there were a female, never mind a majority, just 50-50 female, let's say, in the U.S. Congress, um, or let's go further, 60% women, the end of men we're hearing lately, so maybe soon, I don't know. Um, what difference would it make, do you think? Well, can I have another 20 minutes to answer no. that? Um, I believe we'd pass pay equity legislation. We'd have universal child care, paid maternity laws. Um, I mean, the list really goes on and on, and we see the impact that it makes when we have more women at the table. We're talking about, you know, if Senator Gillibrand wasn't in Congress, would we be talking about the Safe Baby Products Act and, you know, chemicals and shampoos? I'm not sure. Um, if we didn't have Congressman Songus on the Armed Services Committee, would we be talking about um, sexual assaults in the military? I'm not sure. Would it change policy beyond these which are sort of formally, technically women-oriented issues? What about on the grand scale? You, I don't know, U.S. strategy, the U.S. footprint in the world, the U.S., you name it. Would, would it change our overall profile as a nation and our policy, policy projection? I would argue that these are not just women's issues, that, you know, things like I don't transportation. Mean to, uh, no, not just, but everyone right. you named had a specific women's right. tie to it. And I'm asking about those that are quite, quite apart from that right. and often seen as larger issues. Pentagon spending, right? Um, you know, uh, I don't know, globalization, you, you name it. Would it have an effect on those kind of in fairly gender neutral, very big issues? I think it would, and the reason is because women tend to be more inclusive and, and work across party lines. You know, um, one of the senators actually Except joked. You. <laughs> very nice, that was very good. Right, well, uh, that's a good point. Um, but we, we heard jokes that during the Affordable Care Act debate, um, so one of the women senators said, we should send all the men home because we would get this done in the next two hours. You know, we, we know that women are, are building bridges and working more inclusively and just tend to be more collaborative in their leadership style. So I absolutely think that on these gender neutral issues that you named, we would see a major impact. If there's a war on women, if there is, why? Is it strictly for political gain? Or is there some deeper vestigial urge here going on to hold women down? What, what, what's it about if, if it's going on? Well, we, we saw in 2010 the pendulum really swung. Um, and a lot of uh, what we called sort of Tea Party Republicans got elected. Um, and, a, and a big part of their agenda was um, you know, stripping away women's right to choose, um, certainly not advancing women's rights like pay equity and maternity care. Um, as examples, and so we saw the impact of that in these next two years after they, after a large swarm of them were elected in 2010. But what, what is that about? Is it a battle to sustain patriarchy? Sure. I mean, it certainly doesn't help men in Congress when there when there are more women running and becoming more powerful. I think it, it's uh, um, quite a threat to them uh, that more women want to be out of the house and working, or you know, um, a threat to them as politicians or a threat to them as males. I, I think a little bit of both. 
I, th I mean, in my core feminist belief, I absolutely believe it's a threat to patriarchy, which. When does the status quo, hey, there you go. <laughs> Feminists. Who, who? When does the status quo break and shift, if it does? I mean, more women are going to college now. More are graduating with right. legal degrees, with uh, medical degrees. Uh, you see the end of men on the cover of magazines. When does this break into political representation and power? Well, you know, it's interesting you mentioned those statistics because, sure, more women are graduating and higher numbers from business schools and law schools, but yeah. we're not seeing them in Fortune fi as fi Fortune 500 CEOs. We're not seeing them as partners in law firms. We're not seeing them as doctors. When's it break? What's it going to take to change the numbers into the top of the ranking, you know, power structure? I think we all have to work together on, in, in terms of getting women involved and elected in Congress, um, to recruit them and encourage them and support women as they run to call out this crazy bias and sexism we saw in 2008 when we had two incredibly powerful women. And even, I mean, even last week when we saw that debate asking women about Fifty Shades of Grey, I mean, that should be, you should all have known about that. You know, I mean, that should be much more called out by, by members of the media, by voters. You know, we shouldn't be allowing I did see John Stewart raised it on The Daily Show. Well, John if Stewart. If we can claim that as part of the media. <laughs> Uh, finally, um, in gender terms, that's your, that's your issue in a way. Mm -hmm. Please interpret for us what you've seen in the Brown-Warren race. <laughs> uh, that's an excellent question. I will answer that. <clears throat> I just want to be clear, as an organization, we don't actually endorse candidates. So I am speaking as a, as a person, um, not as a member, of, as, a, as a representative of this organization. Um, you know, we, we have seen a couple of times Senator Brown um, kind of shut down Elizabeth Warren. Um, I, I actually has been on the record by saying she can stop talking about all my votes and all my record, and I think that's a way to undermine her credibility and leadership. Um, and that, that really is a, is a very recent example of, of a you know, concrete thing he's done to try and undermine What's her What's your advice to women when you're training them and you come to the moment when your male opponent looks to shut you down? What do you advise women to do that, at that moment? To keep, you know, to create a network of support around no, you. No, the television camera's on, you're in the debate, and the male opponent moves to shut you down, female candidate. What's your advice? <laughs> Say something in your head <laughs> to get you through that moment, and just power on. You know, show w your strength as a woman candidate, why you're running, why voters should vote for you, and to continue on to the debate. We feel the power. We feel it. Judy Neufeld, thank you thank very you much so for much being for with us. Thank you. Thank you very Appreciate much for being it. here.